Um, I'm John Hyatt, I'm an um, artist, polymath I guess, um, but primarily an artist musician. Um, I work at the other university, at Liverpool John Moores University, where I uh, run research for arts and humanities, um, and I'm a professor of contemporary art. And it's quite taxing, so you can imagine that I was quite pleased that when summer arrived, and I was looking forward to relaxing and being completely antisocial and talking to nobody, and uh, sitting by the seaside looking at the, the sea. Um, but unfortunately, this message came through on Messenger, on Facebook. Hey there, I'm not sure if I've asked this before, the mind plays tricks these days, but do you do commissions? Cheers. I'm after a portrait of myself. It's for an event rather than out of vanity. My reservoirs of vanity ran dry long ago. Now, my problem is I'm inquisitive and that anything interesting I find interesting. Um, and I found this hard to sort of step back from because of the peculiar sort of sentence construction. So, I was dragged, if you like, from my bed where I was happy talking like Gulliver to the horses, um, into what I realised. I realised there's going to be a storm situation. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to hide back under the bed <laughs> didn't really work. Um, but I knew if I took this commission that I'd be out there on my own, and that um, the problem with a commission is you often get flattened by it. Um, the problem with a commission is that it's very dangerous to undertake because it puts you in a sort of professional position where you have to. You have to actually deliver results, um, but as, as Barbara said, you have to have a little faith uh, <laughs> that you'll come through it okay in the end. <laughs> it's still one of the funniest things ever done. <laughs> so I didn't jump straight in, I said, can I ask the user that you need to put it to, that might influence how I do it. And the writer said, don't want your typical flowery frame sepia pick, just want something that better represents me and my tastes in arts. Planning my memorial service, <laughs> nothing maudlin. <laughs> Made my will and power of attorney today, could have been a morbid exercise, but actually quite cathartic. Many people don't get that time to stop and consider how they define themselves in life. Also draws a line under things. I can put it to one side and get on with living for now. Turns out to be general organ failure, sadly from a disease, picked up volunteering in Fiji after Hurricane Winston, a disease that has a brake and accelerator. Excuse me. That's, that's gonna keep happening probably. But no reverse. Let the edge roam. Hate it. <laughs> but no reverse. Just to give you some idea, this is uh, a video of Schrodinger's car. <laughs> <laughs> well, the police officer has to smash the window. I'm gonna, how can I get rid of this? Yeah, just turn on the Wi-Fi off. Turn on the Wi-Fi. Give me a second. So, as I say, it's a spelling mistake, it's Schrodinger's car rather than his cat. Uh, there might be somebody inside, but we don't really know. So the officer's trying to find out. Um, Fiji is an island or a set of islands of Australia. The person writes me, writing to me is living in Australia. Uh, they volunteered in Fiji, and through volunteering, 
contracted an organ wasting disease. He also sent me some um, photographs. He said, I spent a month on life support last year, organ failure, vomited five litres of blood, lungs collapsed, given 24 hours to live, live, had to learn to eat, walk, toilet again for six months. Things were getting better, but it's incurable once organs fail. It's a downward spiral. Shall I, shall I go on? I, the red is me. I say, sure, tempest and the whirlpool. I presume you all know The Tempest by Shakespeare. It's going to be interspersed with this talk. At the beginning, when the storm, Gonzalo, the faithful servant, if you like, the faithful man, uh, says, Nay, good, be patient to the bosun. The bosun says, When the sea is hence, what cares these roarers for the name of king? I think really that is the question of the whole play. What cares nature for the name of king? So he sent me these photographs blurry um, sort of holiday snaps you've got to remember this is somebody I never met I've never met though he's seen me perform live on stage and he's writing to me because um, he's been a fan of my musical career if you like he saw me uh, perform with Frank Sidebottom you know from Manchester with the enormous Papi Mache head originally about 25 years ago, so it's taken 25 years for this guy to write to me and ask me to do his portrait because he's dying. He also sent me photographs of his family and it aroused a sufficient degree of empathy in me to actually keep me out of that bed that I really wanted to stay in. And like Miranda, that empathy, oh the cry did knock against my very heart, poor souls they perished. Had I been any god of power, I would have sunk the sea within the earth, or air, it should the good ship so have swallowed and the fraughting souls within her. It's her empathy for the sailors who are drowning in Prospero's tempest that he's created. So, I made a start. I've started painting your portrait. I'm trying not to be too tired by the photos, but to get behind the images a bit, getting to know you. Imagination has to come into it due to the limitations of the photos. I'm looking for how you stand, how you, how you hold your head, how clothes fall on you, etc., rather than getting the face right yet. Empathy, I guess. If you felt your limbs moving around, expanding and contracting, head feeling a little light, features blurry, are actually disappearing last night as I decided to move your head to the left, then don't panic, it's just me remaking you anew. So these are the first. I'm trying to find him, if you like. He says, haha, all for a remake. The process in itself sounds fascinating. I guess with a subject on the other side of the world, there are certain challenges or perhaps freedoms and opportunities. I'm quietly anticipatory, definitely getting those reassembly symptoms, trying to catch my reflection in a broken mirror with my eyes closed. I say, have you ever visited a big aquarium? I have indeed with big glass tanks, windows. Is that the notion? I like that. I always get the sense the sea life thinks we're the ones trapped outside the glass. <laughs> I say, it's just something I felt when I occupied you. Big jellyfish and rays, weightless, ethereal, pale, graceful and electric. Now, that, I have no explanation for why that was, but the rays, the jellyfish rather, just started to appear. He says, snorkeling off the Great Barrier Reef, nearest thing to flying I can imagine looking down. I love the rays in the aquariums, as you say, serene, peaceful, otherworldly. When they swim over the head, their mouths look like smiles, but it's a false illusion. They can be fatal. Not that I'm saying I'm fatal, but I guess we all wear different masks. I'm certainly guilty of the false, all is fine smile. I say, maybe you'll start to feel something for jellyfish as we go along. There's no right reason why you can't be of the painting as much as the painting is of you. Yeah. 
interesting. I don't know why I saw you amongst jellyfish, but having just done a bit of web surfing, this is a quote from the web about jellyfish, a hole rips through his body, that is the jellyfish, but seals up and heals completely. An appendage is sliced off. The tissues grow back perfectly. He's capable of extreme regeneration, perhaps even immortality. I like the infinity motif. I bequeathed my body what they can use to camera medical school. You can tick the length of time they can keep it. I quite liked ticking the infinity box. Perhaps psychologically, not just a final act of altruism, but my way of regenerating anew against the odds and achieving an immortality of sorts. I had a wife of 20 years, high income jobs in charity sector, JAG, two big house and all that. Those are gone and not coming back and I accept that mainly. Jellyfish can regenerate perfectly and go back to where it was before. Like most other animals, humans can't do that, but they can find the resilience to adapt and find a new way to carry on even in the most dire of situations. I'm making do with the now. As I say, accept, adapt, try to do some good with what I have remaining. Fight injustice to the best of my diminishing abilities and don't lose a sense of humour. There you go, me in a nutshell. Ariel, where the bee sucks, there suck I, in a cowslip's bell I lie. There I couch when owls do cry. But John Brooks, who's the writer, is in a nutshell. I say, can you send me a video of your face, head? I realised that I couldn't do this from these fuzzy photos. He says, hi John, sorry, it will probably be a weekend, the weekend before I get round to vid. Chronic fatigue, a current symptom. Just slept for 40 hours straight. Chronic fatigue and ammonia. On brain, taking over. Still working on bond with those jellyfish. Debilitating, but to be honest, have some incredibly vivid and immersive dreams. Can make waking days seem a bit bland. Doing my best, best, love, lick. End of, end of communication. Caliban. Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that if I then had waked after a long sleep will make me sleep again. And then, in dreaming, the clouds me thought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me that, when I waked, I cried to dream again. So I'm forced to just keep developing the jellyfish side of things, really. And realise that this is insufficient and I am supposed to be doing a portrait. That is interesting, the conversations we've had, I was thinking a lot about, um, about the notion of what, what's being portrayed and the notion of the difference between how you present yourself and how you, as I see you, and how you see yourself, which can be different to how you present yourself, obviously. Um, Obviously, a big part of it, as I'm trying to get across, was, you know, there is a certain element of me, which is the illness, but I don't want that to be defined. I'm not the illness. I'm John Brooks still. I just happen to have that illness. And I think that, again, facially, that's something that I see more, maybe because I've seen the changes it's made. Um, it's made other physical changes to me, but I won't be doing a nude pose. So I started, got new information about his face, about his voice, the sound of him, um, about his sense of humour. I won't be doing a new, nude pose. Um, and all that information helps me to start to develop the no. portrait. But if you look at the video that he sent, um, I'm starting to paint from that, and then I realised that he's speaking into a mobile phone. 
and I realise he's walking around film, filming himself like this. So the bottom area of his face is grossly exaggerated. Mm -hmm. um, so I realised even this new information, I was, I was using it to create a different shaped face, but I realised it was not probably any more accurate than the blurry photographs from years before his illness. So the, the problem really is where is he and who is he and what does he actually look like because it, it changes through time and it changes through context. So I start uh, to just play around with the jellyfish really um, <laughs> and I ask him for another video. Um, meanwhile he says, just remembered until a month ago I was walking through a giant neon jellyfish outside the shopping mall. I say the moon jellyfish can age backward, form hordes of clones and regenerate lost body parts, a new study says. Maybe that's my feeling of dissociation. Jellyfish can regenerate parts and achieve a degree of immortality. As a human, I can't regenerate my damaged organs. Humans can, however, accept and redefine themselves accordingly, a form of adaptive regeneration through change. see that he's not, the lower half of his face is not as pronounced as I was doing it. <coughs> he says one could define the backdrop as either as aspiration to achieve longevity and immortality, which is out of one's grasp, or a metaphor for fighting one's limitations to the end and living a meaningful life with a meaningful death in the absence of the jellyfish powers, of raging against the dying of the light. Am I rambling? No, says me. Remember, I've nearly been there myself. I've been to the edge of bliss, but came back to bring everyone and thing along with me. Uh, by that, he thinks I'm referring to the time when I had throat cancer, because that's sort of public knowledge. Uh, but I wasn't actually. I was referring to a more of a sort of spiritual involution, where I went to the edge of bliss, which is uh, not something I'm talking about now. But. He says he likes that phrasing, and yes, I'm sure you have your own experiences to draw from. Significant in the degree to which a work is by the artist, not the subject. I like the edge of bliss idea. A year to the day, almost, I was on life support, and they'd already said not to resuscitate again. So to be still here after medical opinion has decided otherwise is a little bit of immortality in itself. Full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes, nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Sea nymphs hourly ring his knell, hark, now I hear them, ding dong bell. I'm left with the idea of a sea change into something rich and strange. Maybe that's the undercurrent behind the jellyfish, not immortality, but transmutation. Agree completely. I like the notion of transmutation, physically and mentally. Also the positioning of the jellyfish amongst other sea creatures, as with infinity and space, the ocean is, after all, the third great unknown void. In some ways we know more about the farthest known galaxy than we do about the deep ocean. I'm intrigued, by the way, how do you interpret the facial expression in the work? And I say, ah, it's changing as we speak, because of the reasons we've just mentioned. I think the word would be open, balanced, sorted maybe. So 
see it's changing quite a lot. <coughs> you mentioned still working on the face, he says, which I love. This recent pic of me might help. <laughs> It's funny. Mm -hmm. The basic elements that are pretty similar, aren't they, really? Yeah. <laughs> but they're especially getting similar because I started to change the earlier version of the painting <clears throat> based on the new information, the new front on video. And I, I was gradually alter, altering it gradually rather than just repainting it. And what I realised, the, the face was getting more and more symmetrical, and his face isn't very symmetrical. And what I realised was that actually when you do a selfie video, it reverses the face. Mm -hmm. So what I was actually doing was gradually moving a left-hand biased face and changing it into a right-hand biased face. And halfway through, I'd got halfway through, and I'd actually got this sort of symmetrical face that didn't look like him, which did actually look a bit more like George Clooney. <laughs> so so the, the technology was starting to intervene in the actual depiction, representation. I like it, <coughs> he says though. The crop gives a better sense of the image. That's the crop of the head. My gut reaction on seeing the close-up is rueful. That's not necessarily in a negative way. Fits with the acceptance theme of transformation. I say, I'm trying to make it look like you, but not the way you look. I think the wryness of Rufal fits. Love that. It's what I'm after. I think we're both on the same page on that. And then for the first time I ask him, do you know the Tempest? Oh yes, love literature in all its forms. I've published two books that I'll send you, which he did. Shakespeare is an obsession. Did you know The Tempest was the only original storyline of his? There's a soliloquy in The Tempest that I always felt was a marvellous epilogue, epitaph. <coughs> I need to look it up to get the correct wording. Yeah. Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And, and like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve and, like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. So a bit like the Wham t-shirts <laughs> that you used to get. I made him a such stuff t-shirt. Here you can see I'm still continually playing with the jellyfish at the same time. If you look at the blue, blue one to his right, it's become a sort of more of a yellow eel type thing. So things, and that's just play really, that's just me playing, because to, to maintain the concentration on the, fe on the face at such a small scale, it's not a big portrait head, at such a small scale every mark changes the face completely. So the intensity of concentration you have to maintain requires a bit of play, it requires them to go off and just play with the jellyfish. He says, I always saw Prospero as the embodiment of fate in the summoning of the Tempest, but that works too. And I say, I'm Ariel, I guess, flying to do thy bidding. Although I feel more like Caliban, labouring to make the fruits of Ariel. <laughs> or are those roles reversed? I like the way Prospero brags that he can wake the dead with his sorcery, yet renounces his magic towards the end. An acceptance of reality of one's fate that no dark art can transmute into immortality. I say to make art from coloured mud, transfiguration, 
We're all on the island and the island morphs. It is how we perceive it. This is the people from the shipwreck. Adrian says, the air breathes upon us here most sweetly. Sebastian, who's the, Sebastian Antonio, the guys who overthrew Prospero and threw him out of his kingdom. Um, Sebastian is his brother. As if it had lungs and rotten ones, or as twere perfumed by a fen. So you can see, they see the island in a completely different way. The island is, is not a constant. Gonzalo is always the optimist. Here is everything advantageous to life. Antonio says, true, save means to live, or that there's none or little. Oh, how lush and lusty the grass looks, how green. The ground indeed is tawny, with an eye of green in it. He misses not much. No, he doth but mistake the truth totally. So the island is not something, the island that they've been washed up on where Prospero is the ruler, where Prospero has conjured up the storm to make them crash in the boat. The island morphs according to their internal perception, their expectation. Shakespeare made his last will and testament in the same year as the Tempest. Can I say you have a style, certainly, more in the brush strokes and loose composition, definitely a distinct voice as though if Bacon and Goya had a love child. I feel I'm committing a faux pas there. I said, ha ha ha, I pinch liberally, don't worry. Caliban says of Prospero, if he awake from toe to crown, he'll fill our skins with pinches, make us strange stuff. I'm so playing with these things. They're not even jellyfish, are they? That's, they're just bits of paint. They're more like weird balloon courtiers in some strange underwater mask. However, he says, the discussion we had on the Tempest really linked everything together for me, including the jellyfish. See, the jellyfish are getting old. I like the use of the T-shirt to make the overt Shakespeare reference. Cryptic if you're not in the know, but evident otherwise. P.S. These jellyfish are getting into my head. I'm suddenly seeing them everywhere. I'm starting to feel more like Alonso, the shipwrecked king of Naples, wandering and a bit confused. Just paint. Please don't ask me what the head is with the open cranium and the sort of coral brain inside because to this here because I am wearing a clue you can see the pearls that were his eyes have appeared in the painting behind his left leg his left leg there's also something that I don't think he's noticed there's this sort of big monstrous form appearing behind him a bit like Swamp Thing or something from, <laughs> from uh, the comics. Uh, I don't think he'd approve of that because he doesn't want the background in any way to be sort of metaphorical for his disease. But um, I don't. It's a painting is a feedback loop between the materials and me. And when the materials, are, when the painting is going in a certain direction, I try to go with the flow rather than redirect it in another direction. So there are things that appear and I have to, a bit like the building falling over Buster Keaton, I have to trust that in the end they'll be there for some sort of purpose. I don't actually have to rationalise that purpose at the moment of, of making it. Subtle changes are happening there. You see, you see that those things that I said were courtiers have turned into a sort of blowfish, half of them. Yeah? You see things start to change. And the ground beneath his feet, whereas it's just been sort of nondescript sand of some sort of description, 
has started to get some sort of form. He's now he's now somewhere at the shoreline. This is very small. This head. It's only. But you see, he's got certain features. He's got like um like an indentation here. He's got a scar here. Um, that was why it was important to get the face either one way or the other way because he's not in any way symmetrical. As you say, where each sees reality according to their internal world view, on the island applies to the wider world too, he said. Absolutely, the island morphs dreamlike and plastic to will. So who, to your mind, he asks, is will in terms of this painting? I suggest it's a conjoining of wills. Somehow the painting is made, being made between us. By the way, Fiji must be the island, or represented. Fiji makes sense, or maybe Australia, he says. I say Australia is a big, big island, a big island with a roundabout in the middle. I was a technician at Manchester School of Art. I had some, some visitors, or people that Liz and I actually um, just picked up in the middle of Manchester who were visiting from Australia. Mm -hmm. They're on the World Grand Tour, and they had nowhere to stay, so we said, well, you can come back to our house. And then I took them into the art school the next day, and the technician was there. And I said, I introduced Eddie, his name was. I said, Eddie, these two people are from Australia. And he went, oh, I, Australia, like a... A big place with a roundabout in the middle. <laughs> so that was why I said that. And he said, yes, as is a tempest storm, which I thought was really nice, as in the eye of. So a tempest is actually um, a big place with a roundabout in the middle. Uh, and I say, yeah, I have you at the eye, the Emerald City, the island on the shoreline. The island, yes, indeed. <clears throat> Why I say the Emerald City is because the Wizard of Oz is more or less the same story, isn't it? There, there's a, a history as, of human stories about myths about the storm and the great storm being the thing that returns everything to the way, to the order it should have in the beginning. Um, Dorothy is taken by a twister uh, from a house in order to be taken to Oz. And when, when she gets to Oz, um, she's got representations of the people from her local neighbourhood who are represented as the Tin Man, the Lion uh, and the Scarecrow, and they're all lacking in something. And they want to go and visit the wizard in order to get uh, a heart, courage, etc. And when they get to the wizard, um, basically the, the wizard puts on a, a frontage of, of power, like a, a voice with lots of reverb on it, but he's actually a little guy behind a curtain. But the magic of the wizard, the wizard is a wizard, because the magic of the wizard is he gives them what back what they already have. So he gives uh, the, the one in, the, the scarecrow needs a brain, he gives him a college certificate and now he's got a college certificate he believes he has a brain whereas nothing has actually changed apart from he's got this college certificate so that the journey through caused by the storm is a journey of returning home Dorothy finally clicks her, her red shoes together and returns home um, it's a journey of returning home but returning home changed so it's about metamorphosis of returning home changed by the storm. This is a great bit here, where the woman on the bike turns into the witch. But this has got all the elements that the Tempest by Shakespeare has got. It's got the witch, which is Caliban's mother is Sycorax, the witch. It's got the storm. Um, it's got the wandering down the yellow brick road in this case. And this is where house, lands, the magic begins.
Good news, says John. Gastro went well today. No bleeding arteries. So my monthly sessions now yearly. Jellyfish. <laughs> I think the painting deserved a little electric kiss. <laughs> It's actually the centre of the jellyfish that's disappeared to make the electric eel. But it can be butterfly. <laughs> you can see I'm getting near the end now because I've signed it. Um, I sign it before the end. I sign paintings as people expect them to be signed. I sign them as part of the process because um, I can't put them on afterwards. Because when the painting is finished, it's finished. And to add a signature changes it and starts the whole process again. Mm -hmm. So the signature has to appear. The relationship with the foreground is more blended. A light joins them. Did you notice the light appear yeah. behind it? Between the monster's legs? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I felt previous versions showed my weakness more. That's what I want to convey. That's why I'm not Prospero, even though I want to be. The definition, I mean, of this creatures and things, uh, makes it calmer, more ordered. You prefer the weakness to be shown? Prefers the wrong word. I think what I feel is a balance between aspiration and reality. The aspiration is to put a brave face on things. Don't upset loved ones. It's not their fault, so why upset them? The reality is, I have a terminal illness, poor me. Sympathise with me, tell me how wonderful and stoic I am. There's honesty. Been staring at it in the context of additional news on my condition today and processing, reprocessing it in the light of things, the portrayal of me. I bloody love it. I say life is a terminal disease for us all. In this picture you have no disease. Here you live forever. You have commissioned this for them for the loved ones. Here you have suffered a sea change into something rich and strange. I am making you a wonder of the island, which is what you are. Thank you. It's my pleasure. As a visual artist, he says, which is not, it means if he was, I'd be interested in if in the act of creating an artwork is a journey for the artist, what drives his decision to stop the journey? Is there a sense of risking an unfinished work if one gets off too early? Or going over a cliff if one goes too far? How does he know when he's arrived where he wants to be with a piece? The piece asks for nothing more to be done to it. This is my answer. You stand there with the brush in your hand and there is nothing to be done which is why the signature has to enter previously. Okay, I get that, but how does that dialogue between the piece and the artist articulate itself? The artist is but the conduit, surrendered. This rough magic I hear abjure and I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. So at the end, I gave him his books, 
At the end, if you notice, I gave him his ray. The monster disappeared at the very end and became the ray. Okay, so that's the end of the painting. So who made this portrait? Roman Ingarden is a theorist and um, proposed a theory of concretization. Um, and in this theory, it's about writing, about literature. In this theory, the reader and the author collaborate to make the work. The author leaves gaps in the work, which the reader, in the process of reading, fills in. Um, so, in, in a very crude sense, say, say that you say uh, in a text you've got the word tree, a reader, the author might mean um, a certain type of tree, but the, the reader will bring in a tree from his experience or her experience to fill in that undescribed gap. So, he might be thinking, the, the author might actually in his mind be thinking of an oak tree, but the reader fills it in with a willow tree. Um, so, there are gaps in any work. And it was the same in art theory. Marcel Duchamp, who famous for the fountain, which was a toilet, a urinal, called the fountain, um, in 1917 claimed that the, the viewer completes the artwork, that the artwork is not complete until the viewer um, brings the viewer's experience to the work. Whitehead, in Science in the Modern World in 1928, said the concrete is the acting, and the abstract is that which acts. So the extension is that the reality resides in the act of experience or interaction with actors. So as we said in the previous talk, um, there's a difference between reality and actuality. Whitehead's claiming that actuality is the thing that exists, and reality doesn't. So who made this portrait? The artist, the subject, and not forgetting the viewer, thanks to my wife, not forgetting also the history of painting, I couldn't have made it without the history of painting. A guy called Michael Harding, who was a painter at the Royal College of Art, who was di disgusted with the poverty of colour in Rowney and Winter and Newton paints, so started to grind his own paints. Um, his paints were so good that his peer group asked him if he'd make paints for them. Eventually, he realised he was a better paint maker than he was a painter, <laughs> so formed a company to sell paints, and those are the paints, the only paints that I use, because they're more colourful than other paints. Whoever weaved the canvas that I painted it on, Jenny Brooks, his mother, and his father for having him. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could call that a big bang. <laughs> his wife, his daughter, the disease, music, because he only got in touch with me because of music. Shakespeare, who was Shakespeare? Was he Edward de Vere? I think he probably must have been. Um, is Shakespeare a pseudonym? I think it probably is. Will, will the idea of will, Shakespeare, the goddess Minerva, from which we get, from which the Latin mens, mind, comes. The goddess of um, creativity, wisdom, war, who carries a spear and also carries a, a lightning bolt. Uh, so she carries spear and lightning. Um, she shakes the spear. It must be a pseudonym. Will Shakespeare must be a pseudonym by somebody who's very clever and very classically trained. It's got to be somebody like De Vere. I don't care what other people say, and not some, not some guy from stratford upon -Ain. Buster Keaton, the movie technical crew, the film industry itself that brought it to us, another John Hyatt, who was the mayor of New York, who invented celluloid. <laughs> invented celluloid as a coating for billiard balls to stop, to make them move, to make them move more smoothly. L. Frank Baum, who wrote The Wizard of Oz, the inventors of the alphabet that allows me to communicate with John on the other side of the world, Apple, um, which make the technology, the technical, financial, legal and operational aspects of the devices used, a service ecosystem that's involved there, 
labor arrangements, supply <laughs> chains, designers of my iPhone in Cupertino, assembly lines in Shenzhen in China, where they're made with long hours, high rates of injury, toxic chemicals, low wages, high suicide, raw materials such as cobalt in the iPhone's lithium batteries, mined by hand in the Congo by children, tin in its soldered seams from the Indonesian island of Bangka, where the water table is irreparably fouled and coral reefs, reefs are destroyed, streams polluted, children still born and cancers diagnosed, satellites of the GPS system, Maxwell for in coming up with the equations that made all that possible, Newton, Leonardo for the scientific method, global and extraterrestrial networks, apes, fish, jellyfish, my lizard brain, single cell organisms past and present, and those imbricated in the context of viewings, galleries, critics, universities, and now you sell. Oh, you never win an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> Unaccustomed as I am. <laughs> so who made this portrait? This portrait is never made. Reality is not in things, but interactions of everyone and everything. The painting is remade with every interaction. The portrait also remakes the things it is a part of. There's no reason why you can't be of the painting as much as the painting is of you. There are no boundaries, only degrees of porosity, openings and ruptures. The painting is continually remade by everything, including itself, because there is no such thing, just a metamorphosing continuum of interactions. This painting is not an object. It is an, inter it is an interpenetration of experiences born on trajectories of wills. Every object is this. Every object is an adverbial trace of every interaction and choice. Inaction is an action too. So if I'd stayed in bed, I'd stayed in bed, that would have been an action. All consciousness. In acting, we are immortal as an adverbial trace of every interaction and choice. We are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Even beyond the sleep, of course, our last will and testaments project us forward. So who made this portrait? Each will on its path through space and time expands a dynamic universe. These multiple interacting, fluctuating universes of mutating information shuffle information continually like genes at conception. Interactions are the blending of information clouds. We always tell each other stories to make friends. And what is outside these clouds? Outside the clouds, below them and within, coincident with the universe clouds of information, is what I'm calling the grey. This is a painter's term for it. A zone of A formation. A zone of not yet being formed as yet undisturbed potential information, neither the one nor the zero, but in artist terms, let's call it the grey. The unformed information, Schrodinger's cat, the policeman and the car, a formation, the island, the quantum field. It is insensual, it is beyond language, it is the Tao that we just talked about, it is the underlying spirit world in Shakespeare. It's the eye that's missing. Sprit world. It is the raw material for everything. It is the absolute potential information. Prospero can tap into this. Without Prospero or the witch Sycorax, this spirit world yearns for freedom to follow the ebbs and flow of the field. 
Crossrow, ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes and groves, and ye that on the sands, like John, with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and do fly him when he comes back, by whose aid, weak masters though ye be, I have bedimmed the moon, the noontide sun. Yet for all Prospero's power he must give it up. His control in a final act of he must give up his control in a final act of will and trust. Because love for his people is the attractive force for universal harmony of the spheres. None of this tempest and reconstruction would have been necessary if in the first place Prospero had loved his people and not being selfish and just paid attention only to his books. Surrender of the self is the via positiva, selfish ego is repulsive. The centre of it all is love. The path to pure love is empathy and it is a feminine force. Miranda was the highest example of this natural empathy. Prospero, meanwhile, must learn empathy. Your, your charm so strongly works them that if you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. Dost thou think so, spirit? Mine would, sir, were I human. And mine shall. Hast thou which art but air, a touch, a feeling of their afflictions? And shall not myself, one of their kind, that relish all as sharply, passion as they, be kindlier moved than thou art? Prospero learns his empathetic humanity not from his daughter, but from nature. And realises that the rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. So the artist must deploy empathy and attempt to be as nothing, but a clear conduit to the grey, which is all potential information. The artist must love the work, every brush stroke and every, every colour transition. Love is a revolutionary, empathetic surrender of self-dominance and an immediate transposition of consciousness at the centre of the moment of the open perceptual coincidence of interpenetrating universes. This world today of tempests and climate change, of Brexit and behavioural data theft by Google, Facebook et al, lacks love because it lacks empathy. The true material of the true artist is love, and it is love that is the healing communication via the work. Love arrived at through empathy is an exchange of centres of universes. As Prospero says of Miranda and Ferdinand, at the first sight they have changed eyes. Delicate Ariel has set thee free for this. into hospital for a week, solid. He was um, victim of a robbery, burglary, where they, they knocked him unconscious and tried to stab him in the head with a screwdriver. And, um, then his Facebook profile went offline and his messenger disappeared, so it was as though he died, which is a bit of a shock for me, um, for two days. So I got in touch with his mother who also couldn't get in touch with him. Um, but that was a technical glitch because he'd had his computer stolen in the burglary. And now he's, today, uh, back on Facebook, out of hospital. Um, it's like I'm fine now for you.
looking better than ever. Yeah. <laughs> and his mother even says, um, his mother even says, looking good, nice to see, kiss, kiss. <laughs> So hopefully, the spell worked. <laughs> they are amazing. There's got to be a lot of work in looking at jellyfish. They are amazing. The, the more you look at them, people are starting to work with them. Yeah. But they, they can age backwards. There was a guy who had a, a, a jellyfish that had been dead for three weeks, and after three weeks, um, a polyp developed on one of the tentacles and grew into a new jellyfish. Amazing. So, I wish jellyfishness to you all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your previous institution, the, the John Brooks of that. Yes. Yeah. I the, do. There was a sort of, was it a picture of him in the Brooks building? And I asked one of the staff I know from there, um, but he lists a load of achievements like that. that. And is he just another one of these vice chancellor charlatans? Uh, and he said basically yes. Yeah. And he he, he 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 moved everything he could to get you know this building named after him, which is quite a scandal. Really. <laughs> well, we can rename it. Yeah, yeah. that's really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, Whatever it is. <laughs> well, two weeks ago we went to John Brooks's seventieth birthday down in his house. Oh, did he? He's a good friend. Yeah. Huh? yeah. You, you like it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Well, this guy doesn't. I think the problem with being a vice chancellor is uh, you're not in it to be liked. No. I always found him very fair, but then other people didn't. I would Institutions like to, are, are strange. To I like to say, I always tell my students the object is to shut the tutors up. Yeah. And I think we've done it. I thought it was very good. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> If the, if the tutors have something to say when a, when a student presents a design, that's usually bad news because they just pick up the faults and sort of, oh, got this, thing that. And when they're very talkative, that's usually do. But if you shut them up, that's the only one. It's the opposite with the scientific. I think it is, you're right. <coughs> in art, it's, it's one of the differences in art approach, mm -hmm. science approach. Which ties with your making things disappear, in a sense. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I assume the, the monster vanished because you were seeing him. I made him. everything disappear there. Yeah. Yeah. He, he owns this picture now, does he? Um, it's in the post, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. You mean that's a euphemism for your keeping it? Or you <laughs> <laughs> they take a while to dry, you see. <laughs> it's on its way. So are you back to bed now? Or what? We've got another topic. Oh, I never go to bed really. I'm always. Yeah. 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 For some reason, I'm painting um, jets bombing a hospital in Idlib, which is not my usual, usual thing. So maybe, maybe it's changed me. I used to do more political art when I was younger, but lately I've been painting beautiful paintings of music and sunsets, but maybe this, because this is not my usual way of working, I don't do portraits. I've never done a portrait, so it was interesting, it was interesting. Having done it, are you now still happy with it, or getting happier? I happy? could start again uh -huh. and do a different, I think that, that shape, if you like, I mean, if we are, if things are forms in time, you know, so the, ba the baby 
grows and then goes back, like Shakespeare's Seven Ages, mm -hmm. then I think a, a, the process of doing a painting has the same. It, it, it rounds itself with a sleep. Yeah. And you either leave it or you can't the go back to it. Shape of the jellyfish. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, the, the jellyfish are just so great because the shape is actually, I mean, if you walk along a beach and watch the tide going out, uh, the shape of the jellyfish is made by the movement of the tide in the sand. You can see the shape of the jellyfish quite clearly. So they, they probably regenerate because they are more or less exactly formed by the environment within which they move. You know. Shapes of water. They are absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole, whole range of other talks. Did you sense that you and him were connected in some way, despite the? In the end, yeah. In the end, I, we'll be friends forever now. Or... Are you going to visit him? Pardon? Are you going to visit him? Visit him? Yeah. Too far. <coughs> Not unless they invent matter transmitters. It's too far for you, for me. But yeah, I mean, I've been, I toyed with whether to do this talk, because I've never done it before, obviously. I'll talk about the work that I've been doing with cymatics and vibrating sand, which is more to do with harmonics and resonances and, and form. But I've done that talk a few times and I just wanted to be a bit more risky for myself. I think weirdly it completely fit there is a theme emerging in this particular conference and I think this absolutely fits. Yeah. Um, which is I thought on the first day it wouldn't fit at all. Yeah. And that I was tempted to revert to the other talk. Yeah. I think it was perfect. Thank you. I think it's pretty good. Good. Well, we are very common, I think, anyway. Yeah, we're not just... Good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is presented as a hard-won piece in the museum, with his permission, and please... I thought that it could actually make quite a nice little book. Mm. Yes, yeah, we'll cover the book. With a story, with the story. With the story. Basically, yeah. the... Basically, yeah. the slide. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's unusual for me to do a talk where I read quite so much what's on the screen mm -hmm. but there was no way to get around it because I wanted the actual truthfulness of the yeah. things that were said, you know. Mm -hmm. Normally I'd have a slide up and talk otherwise. So. I think there's something really um, interesting about the structure of dialogue and how uh, older, like, let's say, texts of philosophy were, were communicated in dialogue. Mm. as well mm. and I think that's something very mm. uh, yeah it's nice to see that come uh, uh, come through again and yeah. there's something really rich about dialogue as a way to move forward as, as, and, and yeah. share a story or a philosophy yeah I think it's about meaning isn't it really it's about where do we find meaning yeah. or, and meaning so exists somewhere hovering in a sort of lattice between us rather than many meanings. Yeah. yeah. Well, and va value is also important, I think. I mean, I see the artist's job, if there is an artist's job, as, as um, changing value systems, maybe. And I think we're seriously needed at the moment. I think that then the whole of science is also in itself an artist. Yeah. Yeah. I don't personally. I don't have. I don't have any boundaries between. I just think uh, there are things to find out, and there are ways to find things out. But you know, I mean, it's the same thing. It's all the same. I just realized what I see. If you were to present, I think as a visual artists or video artists or what if you you would take like he's doing you know that would be presented would you call this um, such that the streams are made of or would you give a different title or 
as a book, you mean? Or? No, I'm, st I'm still looking at what you just presented. I, I, I would sit and think, uh, if I go to any artist, any uh, museum, art gallery, I would sit and watch this. Right. Mm -hmm. I, oh, is it? It's so, okay. yeah. Oh, right. right. So I just wondered, this seems to be a perfect title. Yeah, yeah. I have to yeah. go if that was presented. Have you ever done any, any of your work been presented like this before? Um, well, along with the visual, I mean, with a uh, uh, video, mm, that type of thing. No. I thought it was perfect what you did. Thanks. Only as me standing talking. I've, mean, pre I've, pre I've presented videos mm -hmm. in galleries, but okay. but they're not videos of. Actually, I have presented a video of me doing a lecture about how the brain works as an artwork. Mm -hmm. So yes, I have done that. It was half. It was half me talking. It was abstracted technically. So it was the line, a green and red line of me talking about how the brain worked. And then on the other side, it was a split screen. The other side was um, a video of cymatic vibrating sound that was moving around. I did a lot of work where I extrapolated a. a I extra, extrapolated a, a, a natural form from watching how sand moves under vibration, and then use the natural form to make three-dimensional um, uh, printed out sculptures, so digital sculptures. And I also used it to make paintings, and I also used it to make um, videos. It's basically the shape of kneading dough. It's a stretching and folding. It's taking the center to the middle. So as a, as a highfalutin universal form, it would, it would say that the, the whole of actuality is itself passing through its own center continually. So the, the, the tree has an acorn, has a tree, has an acorn. And we see it everywhere. Sorry. Uh, what are you talking about? The cl cladney plates, uh, the, the yeah. shapes that you saw and then... The cladney, the cladney plates are symmetrical. Right. The work I was doing was asymmetrical. But uh, doesn't it, isn't it a function of the plate itself and the shape of the plate? Because most of the plates are s squares or they have, so then you get quincunquial sort of yeah. things, but then some of them I've seen are circular plates as well, right? Yeah. So what kind of shape of plate did you use? Or I was using use? a large planar surface that, uh -huh. that was uneven uh -huh. to create an asymmetrical. Uh, what it creates is a system of forms. Uh -huh. I can show you the video. A system of forms um, that are reminiscent of organs in the body, if you like. Um, but the sand moves from one to the other in a laminate structure based upon its uh, size. Mm -hmm. So heavier sand moves slower. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but they all follow a certain rule. And a pile of vibrating sand is basically a, a a grain of sand goes up through the middle of the pile of sand, comes out at the top, spirals down almost to the bottom, then reverses upon itself, spirals the other way, spirals into the centre of the pile of sand, and then back out. So what you've got is a, a double helix, double spiral that I use to create. Do you have a video where you can follow that path? Yeah. I've got a whole talk. Could have done today. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes, not this one. But on the theme that John brought up about this presentation as art and about videos as art, Roger's been videoing all our presentations and nowadays data is cheap. Could we put this whole AMPA conference up on, let's say, Vimeo, for example, where it could be hosted for nothing? So, so and have this and all other. Would anybody, yeah. else, if anybody objects, of course, having their talk up on video, then, or if there are, I mean, I don't think Keaton's copyright anymore. Anything in the talk that you don't want that would cause problems, then that might be a problem. But otherwise, I'd certainly be happy. My stuff going up. Anybody else? Would that be something you could do. John's given his permission for anything to be used. Okay, good. Yeah, they'd only be the wizard of Oz, maybe. <laughs> well, they can use their own eye, they can see it. Come on, come on. Please stay asked for 
for forgiveness, not permission. <laughs> they don't ask us for permission, do they, to steal our behavioural data? So this whole thing came from this gentleman's liking your music, a fan of your music. You know from, excuse the question, um, yeah. sort of like a, a spire um, six, well, six, well, I mean, in, in across oceans, yeah. to come up with this. And, uh, it's a very... Um, I hate to use the word. It seems that the connection, the music was the connection from, well, we talked about music yesterday. There's a connection that uh, just. Yeah. It's not mystical or anything, it's just yeah. that you don't know who you touch. Yeah. No, you don't. You Absolutely. really don't know who you, you don't. touch. You and um, you just create your music touches. Create him. ripples. Yeah. You create ripples. Right. Can I come back to the shape of this plate? You say it was uneven. Was it roughly round or ish? Or was it roughly. Uh, did it have sharp edges? It had sharp edges, yeah. And I use, I use different ones. Round clockwise, back anti clockwise through the middle. That's right. That's pretty damn cool. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, it's, basically, it's basically this shape. You need the. Coffee table book for cyanotics. <laughs> it's basically that shape. Yeah, but then, but, but vertical, so backwards on itself through spirals in both yeah. directions. Yeah, so it's not, it's not planar. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's a double loop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do a, double double a whole series of paintings double, double where I only use that on brush on the other. Reversed. So I just did that brush mark millions of times for a painting and allowed the painting to emerge from at different scalar levels. Yeah. So I'd do it big. Have you got that on you? They're all on, on, the, on the laptop. Yeah. It's lots. And then um, getting smaller, smaller, smaller. Mm -hmm. And eventually the painting emerges mm -hmm. from... Well, if I see something start to emerge, like a child, I'll paint it in. Yeah. You know, go with it. So, yeah. so, so you see the monster when it appears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I suggest we maybe go eat something? Oh. Yeah.